Amen. Thank you to those who led us in worship. Hopefully on your way into the sanctuary, you grabbed the elements of the Lord's Supper. We will celebrate that towards the end of my sermon. As we now draw our attention to the Word of God, if you would join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful on a cold day that we can gather in a warm building uh, with warm people as your church. We are thankful for the worship that we have already experienced. We pray that it has been pleasing to you. We pray that it has flowed from sincere hearts. And Heavenly Father, we also pray that our worship, worship would not stop now, that our worship would continue as we open up our Bibles and we open up our ears to hear from you. May you use this time to mold us and shape us, to build us up into the church you've called us to be. We bow our lives before you. And we bow this church before you. And we ask that your will be done, not ours. And we pray these things. So thankful that we can pray to you and our prayers do not hit the ceiling and fall to the floor. But our prayers, whether voiced out loud, voiced in our minds, voiced in our hearts, our, our, our prayers are voiced and enter your throne room in heaven. And we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. As we discussed last week, at the very end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus handed to the church the Great Commission. He told those original disciples, and he told us, go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all that I've commanded you, and surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. To begin this sermon series, we discussed the Great Commission last week, and we now discuss the specifics of the discipleship strategy of this church. Gather, grow, go. Gather, grow, go is how we attempt to fulfill the Great Commission. And we walk through this every January in an effort to keep the main things the main things. So gather, grow, Go Today we discuss gather, and we do so by looking at an early gathering of the church. If you would join me, Acts chapter 2, we'll pick it up in verse 41. Acts 2, we'll begin at verse 41. That may seem like a strange place to begin, but we'll discuss that in a moment. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. If you're ready for God's Word, can I hear a big, loud amen? amen. Acts 2, verse 41. Those who accepted His message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They 
broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen to that portion of Acts chapter 2. Uh, from that passage, we've got a few things to discuss. I've got a few points for you. And the first is this. We gather with God. And we'll build on this idea uh, throughout our time together this morning. The gathering of the church begins on an individual level. As I like to say, your faith is personal. You really can't live off the faith of a parent or a neighbor or a co-worker. You can't live off the faith of the person in the pew next to you. You can't live off the faith of your pastor. Your faith is personal. And from there, as we're discussing the discipleship strategy of this church, I, I exhort you that, that you need a consistent and fruitful devotional life. You, you need fruitful time where, where you are bowing your life before God Almighty. These moments in your day when you're laying yourself down before God and crying out, your will be done. Form Christ's likeness in me. We see in Acts chapter 2 a, a gathering of the church. But what we don't see there is that did not come to the neglect of private devotion. And well, how do we know that? Well, perhaps that's an assumption being made. But we do have the example of Jesus. And we assume those early disciples and then subsequently the church followed the example of Jesus. We have littered throughout the Gospels these little glimpses of Jesus' time spent alone. A passage like Luke 5.16 says that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. If he did it, you should do it. If he did it, how much more should you do it? Uh, you need a consistent and, and fruitful devotional life. I don't want to spend much time here, but we try to help you with this. One of the tools that we hand to you to put into your toolbox is our Bible reading plan that we provide each year. We call it God's Word for God's people. We've got paper copies throughout our building. You can access the Bible reading plan on our church app. It's a tool we give to you so that you can spend time each day in God's Word. If you haven't jumped into the reading plan yet, it's not too late. The real goal is not for you to finish the plan each year within a specific time. The real goal is that you're gathering with God, that you're in His Word each day. This year's plan is a read through the entire Bible. Each day has an Old Testament and a New Testament reading. Much work was done to attempt to put those stories in a chronological order so that as you read the Bible this year, you gain a glimpse of the larger story of the Bible. So this series is meant to discuss our church and the discipleship strategy of our church. And we're talking here about gathering with God. And you might walk into the sanctuary this morning and go, well, Pastor Jeff, I, 
I'm trying this church thing, but it just doesn't seem to be yielding the results. Let me offer a suggestion. Could it be, just could it be, right? I'm not pointing fingers, I'm just asking the questions, right? Could it be that your problem with the church stems from the fact that you are not gathering with God, that, that you don't have a consistent and fruitful devotional life? Could it be that you walk in here and, and expect the church to do everything for you? Could it be that, that you gather in here and you give God one hour to do something big. When we read an Acts passage, we, we read a passage like Acts chapter 2, we see the gathering of the church, but that gathering of the church does not come to the neglect of a consistent and personal, fruitful, devotional life. If you're still with me, can I hear an amen? amen? We've got a lot to do this morning. I was telling my wife last night that the sermon was a bit long and I needed a miracle by the morning. And uh, I told her the exact word count of my manuscript and she said, well, you could just speak faster. <laughs> to which I said, I've tried that since birth and it just has never happened. Uh, gather with God. My second word for you this morning is we gather with God in community. I said moments ago, your faith is personal. I stand by that. Your faith is personal, but it's not private. God never intended for you to follow Jesus in isolation. When we read through the pages of Scripture, we see over and over again that the Christian faith is not a solo adventure. When we read through the pages of Scripture, we see people coming to faith, and then in the next breath, we see them coming into the life of the church. And with that, I, I do want to correct a common misconception. Um, if you've been here the last few Januaries, you've heard me do this before, you've watched me walk through this, hopefully I'm dusting off the cobwebs. You give me another 10 more years and we're going to know this passage really well. When we read this moments ago, I started at 41, Acts 2 verse 41. And if your Bible is formatted like mine is, that might have seemed like a strange place to begin reading the passage. If your Bible is like mine, I've got verse 41. And then verse 41 is separated from 42 in the remainder of the chapter by a large heading, which in my Bible is in all capital letters and bold which for us seems to be like there's a natural break between 41 and 42. But in a passage like this, that chapter heading, which was the decision of the editor of your particular Bible, they wrote that heading, they placed it there. But that heading leads us to read Acts chapter 2, specifically the verses we just read, in two segments and I believe to our own detriment. If, if we were to just pick up our Bible and start at 42, and we were to read, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together, and they had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. If we read that passage in isolation, we might be falsely led to believe, well, man, this must have been some super group of Christians 
It, we might be led to believe, man, there's like just regular Christians, and then there's this group right here, like the Navy SEALs group of Christians. Like th this is the hardcore committed group. But that notion is erased if we read 41 and then immediately read 42. 41, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Right into verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking bread, and to prayer. This wasn't some super group of Christians. This wasn't a Navy SEALs church. This is a group of people who had just heard Peter preach. They had just heard the gospel. They had just heard Peter recount these Old Testament stories, and he showed how those Old Testament stories pointed to the Jesus who had just been crucified, the Jesus who had just been raised from the dead. And these group of believers say, we've heard that message. What do we do now? And Peter told them, repent and be baptized. And they repented, and they were baptized. And they immediately entered into the church. They immediately began to experience Christian community. So yes, we, we gather with God, and we gather with God in community. I like to use that word of Christian community. It's people that are committed to relationship and partnership due to the impact of Jesus. Christian community, people committed to relationship and partnership due to the impact of Jesus. That's what makes the church different from every other group. It's what makes the church different from the Lions Club, the Booster Club, the Country Club, or CrossFit. It's not that we just share common interests or we have the same hobbies. It's that we've heard this gospel and we've believed and it's provided us abundant life and eternal life and we've been brought together. And because of that, we develop relationships. We care for one another. We walk through life together. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, what do you mean by relationship? Well, you, you actually get to know each other. It's that simple. Well, what do you mean by partnership? Well, that you actually accomplish gospel priorities together. That simple. And we see a passage where it's lived out before us due to the impact of Jesus this particular group. They devote themselves to gathering together, to obey Scripture and to pray, and to meet needs and to share meals, and of course, to make more disciples. So that's why we gather together each week. We gather on Sunday mornings, we gather on Sunday evenings, we gather on Wednesday nights. We've built into the structure of our church opportunities for us to gather together. And then outside of those weekly gatherings, we also have various other meetings and ministries, more opportunities for us to gather, to develop relationships and partnerships, and of course, we, we are encouraging you, as you gather here, to develop relationships that extend beyond our weekly gatherings. You see that in this passage as well. They, they gather together in the temple courts, but they're also gathering together in their homes. So again, we're talking about the discipleship strategy of this church. <laughs> 
And you might walk into our sanctuary this morning and you might say, well, Pastor Jeff, you you talk about church and you talk about all these wonderful things, but I'm not experiencing those things. So how about one more suggestion? Could it be that that your problems, your, your struggles with the church stem from the fact that you haven't truly entered into Christian community. Here, you may attend a service. You, You may even come into a Bible study class. But my question is, do you actually know people? And do people actually know you? As we gather, with God, and God calls us to gather together in community. A few more points for us this morning. We need to move quickly. We, we gather with God, we gather with God in community, and we gather for the purpose of worship. We don't gather out of obligation or religious ritual. We don't gather together for the social benefits. We we don't gather together for the free child care on the other end of the building. We gather together for the purpose of worship. We have a God that is bigger than us, wiser than us, stronger than us. We we have a God who created us, a a God who has provided for us and sustained us. We, We have a God who has given us eternal life through the cross and the empty tomb. He's worthy of our worship. And as His church, we gather together for the purpose of worship. And it's with that, very quickly, And I want to draw your attention. There's a few more points, but I want to draw your attention to the elements of the Lord's Supper that you picked up on the way into the sanctuary. A frequent aspect of our gathering together for the purpose of worship is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. There are many who take the references of breaking bread in Acts chapter 2 is references to the church celebrating the Lord's Supper. So a few things on the Lord's Supper before we celebrate. The, the Lord's Supper tells the gospel story. And I like to say that this frequent and consistent celebration of the Lord's Supper, it, it forms us and it reforms us. And that every time we hold the bread and the cup in our hand, we're able to look around and see that we are a part of the family of God solely based on the grace of God seen through the cross and the empty tomb. That every time we hold the bread and the cup in our hand, We are forced to tell the story of a Savior who died for the sins of the world, who provided eternal life that we could never gain on our own. And when we hold the bread and the cup in our hand, it forces us to take our eyes off of ourselves It forces us to take our eyes off of our problems, and it fixes our eyes upon our crucified and resurrected Savior. The Lord's Supper tells the gospel story, and I would also say the Lord's Supper creates gospel community. The Lord's Supper, it it forms us and reforms us, not only as individuals, but as a church, as a community. 
frequent and consistent celebration of the Lord's Supper keeps the gospel at the center. So hear this, right? It, it keeps the gospel at the center. The, the center is not a pastor or a program or a building. The Lord's Supper keeps the gospel at the center. The Lord's Supper also keeps the gospel at the center of our hearts and minds. The center of our hearts and minds should not be consumed with worldliness or superficiality or secondary things. The Lord's Supper also keeps us unified. As I said moments ago, we are people with different ups and downs, people with different victories and defeats, people with different bumps and bruises, but we're brought here by a common Savior. And the Lord's Supper also forces us and it calls us to be forgiving people and gracious people and generous people. The, the Lord's Supper calls us to reflect upon our sin and the depth of God's grace towards us. So as we hold the bread and the cup in our hands, I, I remind you of that night in the upper room when Jesus held this bread and cup in his hands and he created a powerful symbol for the church. He said this bread and this cup is a, a symbol of my sacrifice on your behalf. And he instructed the church, do this. And every time you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So the Lord's Supper is for those who have embraced Jesus as Lord, those who have confessed sin and embraced the forgiveness that Jesus has provided us. So if you are one who has done so, if you have made Jesus the Lord of your life, I encourage you to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. If you are a parent in the room with children, again, this is a celebration for believers. Um, if your child is a believer, by all means, they can celebrate with us. If they are not, please use this opportunity and conversations to follow as an opportunity to preach the gospel to your child. I ask you to pick the Lord's Supper elements into your hand. I invite you to peel back the layer that gives you access to the bread. Once you have done so, if you will lift that to the air. And before we celebrate, a, a moment of reflection. As we celebrate this meal, know that you are loved by God. I pause there so that we can grasp the depth of that statement. Know that you are loved by God as demonstrated, as proven by his sacrificial death on the cross, by Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross for you. That night in the upper room, Jesus held the bread in his hands and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And now I invite you to remove the layer that gives you access to the cup. Once you have done so, if you will lift the cup into the air, 
before we drink a moment of reflection with this cup in your hand. May you know that you have been forgiven by God. Again, I pause so that we can take in the depth of that statement. With this cup in your hand, know that you have been forgiven by God as demonstrated by his spilled blood on your behalf. That night in the upper room, Jesus held the cup and he said, this is my blood in the new covenant poured out for you. Take and drink. Before we pray and sing a song, if uh, you are a visitor with us this morning, I, I invite you to return. If you are a non-Christian, I invite you to give your life to the Savior of the world and be baptized. If you're tuned in to this broadcast at home, I'd invite you to join us in person. If you're an occasional attender of this church, I'd invite you into regular attendance. Um, if you're a regular attender who is ready for church membership, I'd invite you to initiate that conversation with me. For all disciples present, I'd invite you to the task of making more disciples. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, that you have given us eternal life in your Son. I, I pray that we would hear that gospel, that we would receive that gospel, and that we would stand upon it and never be moved. Father, I pray that the disciples in this room would be given courage and boldness to carry on with the task of preaching the gospel and making more disciples. Father, I pray for those hearing the sound of my voice who have yet to give their life to you. May you break through. May your gospel cut them to the heart. And may they repent, give their life to you, and be baptized. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this church. May it be strong. May it be healthy. May it fulfill the Great Commission. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.